But as soon as we start ramping up into tech earnings, that's what's driving that 13, 26, and 40 moving averages, which essentially just shows the trend. Is, is it going up? Is it going down? And it acts as a means of support and resistance as well. And that right that right now says the trend is waning because it's not hugging that higher end of the band. But that just means a little bit of consolidation. We'll find some support. Then we just need a catalyst to push us higher. And normally that catalyst is is the earnings season or somebody could tweet something. Who knows? <laughs> well, We're joined today by Jessica Inskip. She is the director of education and product at Options Play and the co-host and founder of the Market Make Her podcast. We'll be talking about uh, the latest earnings releases as well as stock uh market outlooks and uh, how AI is going to be playing a bigger role in our markets. Welcome to the show, Jessica. Thank you for being here. Yeah, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad we can connect and excited for today's conversation. Uh, thank you very much. I've seen you on um, CNBC and Yahoo. And yeah, you're, you were great on, um, on the media. So I wanted to get you on my show. So thanks for being here. You've also got your own show, which we can uh, chat about uh, towards the end of the um, uh, interview. So stay tuned to learn more about uh, Jessica's uh, podcast as well. And uh, I want to talk first about earnings. So uh, a lot of disappointments from yesterday. We're speaking on Thursday today, but the markets didn't do well yesterday. We have a bit of a bounce today. Um, are you concerned about uh, earnings missing a lot of estimates this quarter? No, not necessarily, because the focus is more on AI and technology. And I want to make sure that I see the demand there and earnings within that sector specifically. So that is okay. Whereas if I see earnings misses and more in retailers and things like that, that all goes into the broader picture of the all overall macro environment where I want to see what the Fed is pulsating. So meaning when we go through earnings season, not only is it, are we still seeing earnings growth? So for example, when we're, we're finalized Q1 and now we're getting into Q2, getting those Q1 earnings, we've had earnings revisions down, but it's not as much and that's normal. So that's a positive sign. And earnings have also bottomed as of last year, since we have positive quarters and we're still on that trajectory of positive quarters, that still is good. So overall, I focus more from the earnings perspective on that growth picture in the AI narrative, which is seemingly positive. And then I just want to see the broader participation. And then earnings can give us an insight into companies' health overall, consumer spending and awareness. And that that to me still seems positive. We keep saying they're hanging in there, the consumers, and they, they certainly are. Resilient is the word. Yeah, and certainly you've heard this before, but if you take away the Magnificent Seven stocks, I think it's maybe just five of them now, uh, the, the broader market hasn't done as well. So even just looking at the Russell, it's been pretty much flat for the last two years, a um, mm -hmm. bit of a rebound the last year. So how would, you, how would you respond to the argument that the overall stock market isn't really doing that great? It's just a few stocks and you have to be, it's an environment to be really selective right now. Yeah. So I think if you're looking at the earnings, it we can pull data and I think paint any picture we want, which is so interesting with the market mechanics. Yeah. But I, I do agree in the sense from the earnings view, but we have to remember the, the market's forward looking. And when we look at broader participation, that's when I focus more on a technical view. So looking at the S&P 500 equal weight, for example, that is definitely more positively positioned from that forward PE ratio than the S&P 500. And same with the Russell. And so I see broader participation as in there's demand for those securities looking at the functions of supply and demand versus the solely just that magnificent seven or that narrow rally that we saw within the NASDAQ 100. Having that natural rotation is, is definitely good. Now within the Russell, I know earlier in the year, and I was inclusive of this, or the famous Tom Lee coming in and saying value, 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 that, of course, is with the indication that the Fed is going to cut rates. Those smaller businesses that are a little more capital intensive or need those funds are going to positively benefit from a less restrictive Fed. So that I, I, there is certainly risk there, depending on what the Fed does. But we still have a lot of data until we until we get to that point and really understand it. But I still I see this as I don't see what we're in this euphoric phase. It's just this natural rotation that we're having and that's healthy. And I think that's a good sign. And I've really, I'm, I'm pounding the table on AI I have for quite some time. And I know we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Yeah, we will. Um, let's talk about the NASDAQ. So um, a big run up since all the way extending to the beginning of 2023. And um, I know you've, you know, analyzed trends a lot. Are we due for a pullback, Jessica? 
Yeah. So I like to look at the NASDAQ 100 rather than the NASDAQ composite, just because the NASDAQ composite is a little more diverse now. So if we want to, but it tends to leap. So from a technical perspective, I have a very different charting view than most people, but it it's because it's a, uh, I like to call it qualitative, quantitative, if you will. Okay. So I, I use the 13, 26, and 40 moving averages on a weekly basis. I normally look minimum to two, to two to three years on a chart. And the reason why I use the 13, 26, and 40, if you look at that time frame, 13 weeks represents one quarter, 26 is two, and then 40 is three. So since we look at the markets quarterly, we kick this off, stop talking about earnings. I want to look at the charts technically from that same type of lens. So if you look at my charts, you'll see the 13, 26, and 40 moving averages. I want to see them it's very simple at this point, just sloping upwards. If they slope upwards, that means price is increasing on a rolling quarter basis. And that is good indicative of earnings without even looking at the fundamental aspect. I still see that on the NASDAQ 100. It's gone a little far and that's okay. So on top of that, what I do is I add a simple, actually first technical indicator I ever learned over a decade ago, Bollinger Bands. It's, it represents two standard deviations from a price. So if you take the math behind it and you have an upwards trend, you can utilize that for strength of a trend because it's hugging the higher end of the range. That's waning a little bit. So consolidation is absolutely normal before we go higher. But if we pull when we started earnings and what's really accelerated us into those rally modes, it tends to be that ramp up as we can Consume that data. But as soon as we start ramping up into tech earnings, that's what's driving that 13, 26, and 40 moving averages, which essentially just shows the trend. Is, is it going up? Is it going down? And it acts as a means of support and resistance as well. And that right, that right now says the trend is waning because it's not hugging that higher end of the band. But that just means a little bit of consolidation. We'll find some support. Then we just need a catalyst to push us higher. And normally that catalyst is, is the earnings season or somebody could tweet something. Who knows what will happen with AI? Uh, we, okay, so besides AI and potentially a Fed pivot later on in the year, uh, which we'll talk about, what other narratives are there that could support this bullish sentiment going into the rest of uh, Q, you know, Q3 and Q4? Yeah, so I think there is certainly a lot with the domestication that we have of industrials. I think that could certainly serve as a bullish narrative. And also the gig economy. That's something we haven't talked about. I, we talk about it often, but there actually isn't a lot of data on it. So I, I try to do my research and dig down through these rabbit holes. And the Fed hasn't done a research report or have the good enough data to do some analysis since it, it was, I, I don't have the exact date off the top of my mind, I apologize, but it was in the earlier 2000s area. So it's been too much time, but now the gig economy is so much more prevalent, meaning it's all related in, in a way besides, I think it's hard to say besides Fed pivot and AI, because I think AI increases productivity, which gives us more balance in the labor market, which could lead to a Fed pivot. But then also the gig economy is could be a different picture of the labor market that we're not seeing that could also lead to Fed stance. So it's this big puzzle that comes together. But the gig economy could be the wild card because we don't have the exact data of when that filters into the employment picture. Because if if you have that, you may your side hustle could be 1099s and a means of income. So you're not collecting unemployment because you're not eligible for it. And if you're not collecting unemployment and you're not eligible for it, then we're not going to see you come into the data. But if you lose your W-2 income versus your side hustle or gig economy income or those freelancers, that is a much larger impact on your expenses than the W-2. Or then you get what I'm saying. So that that right there could be a bigger, bigger issue that would emerge, meaning we might have a cooler labor market than we realize, which would lead to more to a, a, a more likelihood of a Fed pivot and cutting of rates. But it's hard to see that. And that to me is our something I'm watching. It's the biggest risk, but it could also be the biggest catalyst. Um, I've seen reports that uh, the US economy has seen the most number of people holding multiple jobs at the same time, I think you've alluded to this just now. A lot of economists mm -hmm. I've talked to don't see this as a great sign, though, Jessica, because if you need multiple jobs, you're clearly not doing as well as you could. And the broader economy isn't supporting that kind of wage growth that many people would like to see, which is why people need multiple jobs. Uh, what do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's some instances. So it depends on what that is. So if you have multiple W-2 income, I would argue that. But if you hold multiple, as in that 1099 income, or you're going into freelancer, that to me is a different type of consumer base that we have right now. It's a different type of economy. Gen Z is a completely different animal. They are entrepreneurial spirits and they they don't, they're just very different. They consume content differently. They aren't necessarily looking for that normal corporate job that my generation was used to. And perhaps they saw what we experienced. And millennials uh, are the most educated generation. They also have the most debt. They have the least assets, whereas the entrepreneurs and anything that could come out of that did better. And they have more easier access to that due to technology. I mean, even thinking about the great financial crisis in 2008, you lost your job, you couldn't go, you know, get sell affiliate links or get things like that with on the social media platforms, you couldn't go drive for Uber, you couldn't do these things. So that creates more of a resilient consumer. So I could I could definitely argue it both ways. If you don't have enough to eat to meet your ends meet and you have to get another job to support you, that is absolutely bad. And I would see that terrible. However, if you're on the younger generation side where you are on this financial literacy train and the intent of you getting another job isn't for W-2, but to create a the word is side hustle for yourself, then that that's a, not a bad thing at all. Yeah. Millennials have uh, pretty much everything going for them now except homes. But that's a topic yeah, for a different discussion. That's so true. <laughs> um, how do you feel about the yield curve having inverted and then now it's re-inverting? If you take a look at just how it's behaved throughout history, every not every single time, but in most instances in the past, whenever the yield curve, I'm taking the 10-year minus the two-year as an example, whenever the yield curve has um, inverted to negative territory, uh, a recession usually follows a few months after that. Um, now, the yield curve has tended to have to reinvert back to zero before a recession officially hits. We're almost there. It's almost back to zero. Uh, is that cause for concern for you, at least, as an indicator that a recession is coming? Yeah, you know, it's hard to argue the, the data there. I, I believe the average time is 13 months when it first inverts before we head into that recession territory. But I think it makes sense to take a step back. And I I hate saying the words, this time is different, because I, I just, I absolutely despise that, but I'm saying it now. So uh, thinking about what the yield curve inversion causes is that credit crunch or that crisis there, or the Fed just moves too far too fast and they tip us into a recession because they affect the front end of the curve. And what I'm thinking about what happened is, is we had that with SVB, and we fixed that in a weekend. I mean, I didn't do anything, but the Fed fixed it in a weekend. Yeah. And that's different than past recessions. We've had some time aside from COVID and it, it's, we do have more technology. We do have access to data. The Fed is being more transparent than usual. I think Powell even said this in one of his earlier speeches where the Fed is really shifting their market dynamics. And I love reading their studies when you pull them out uh, when that they they release ever so quietly sometimes. But one of his statements was, you know, the market is anticipating our every move. And I chuckled and I said, well, the market's forward looking. We are always anticipating everyone's every move. But it was something that clicked to him. And the person who is making the decisions about the rates, it's important to take his mindset aside from my own, because he's going to have the bigger impact. Meaning, I, I think this time is different because we have had some negative negative connotation, negative things happen within the economy, within the banking system, and they've been resolved really, really quickly. And now, since we've have this restrictive environment, the Fed has a toolbox. So it's possible that we'll hit that recession territory. But if that happens, I really think that the the Fed's going to, they will step in very quickly and now they can. And that is definitely a good sign. But everything points back to AI, increase in productivity. If you started this hiking cycle with saying we've got an overheated labor market and all of a sudden you have this new technology that increases productivity and we have a labor supply issue and now all of a sudden we have immigration come in, I really think Powell should just play the lotto at this point as he keeps having things work for him. <laughs> 
he might say that a lottery winning is only transitory, like inflation is. Ah, uh, uh, there we go. <laughs> speaking of inflation, um, is that it, it, are, are we heading down towards two percent? Because the data hasn't been indicating a steepening trend downwards, right? We're still above three percent um, for both headline and core. And uh, I'm looking at the CME Fed watch tool. There isn't a significant probability of a cut even by June. I mean, it's it's over 50 percent, but it's not significant. So what's your take on inflation and ultimately what the Fed's going to do? Yeah, that was interesting when we got the ECB data. That was their their flash numbers, and theirs came down considerably. And they also had some surprises in January and February. So when we get our information, perhaps, especially with the manuf manufacturing that we got yesterday, it would be a little better. I don't like being in the business of predicting that we're going to get there, but what I do want to consider is his stance and what he's looking at. Is he balancing credibility or what is the give and take at this point? So he does consistently say we're on a mission to 2%. I like to call it Powell for Swifties because if you're a Taylor Swift fan, I apologize I'm bringing it to this, but you analyze everything that that woman says to understand because they it's, she just caters to those STEM girls. We do the same thing with Fed Powell, the way that he says something to indicate what he's going to do. He has consistently said 2%, but my question is, what is he willing to give up in order to get to that place? And I see him shifting language just ever so slightly, which is why I like to relate it to that analogy. It's a marathon. Or a, yeah, it is a marathon. We're at that last leg. That last leg perhaps might be the hardest. I don't run a marathon, but that's what people say. I'm more of a weights person. But I, I that to me is is the hardest part. But we're still on the right track. And he said on the last meeting, he wants to see continuation of the trend that we're on. Which means to me that he'll cut as long as he thinks we're getting to that 2%. And what I think the balancing act and the chess game that has to happen here, he made that statement that he feels like rents is going to, because of the lag effects that you're very aware of, rents are going to come in to that data. And that's what's going to help contribute to inflation actually coming down because we might we we're seeing that service and perhaps goods are normalizing at this moment. So services to me is, is the risk as they have been with stickiness. But if rents comes down, which really hits people's expenses, that could be really good for the inflation picture. He just didn't know what the timing was. But the balancing act is this housing supply issue that we have. Arguably, you're, I mean, I, I do own a home and I have a 3% mortgage rate. There is no way I'm selling it. I'm going to live here forever because- <laughs> I don't, I, why would I? It'd end up cost me 40% more to buy the home that's for sale across the street in my neighborhood. That just logically doesn't make sense. And then you multiply people like me, plus the older generation that has most of the wealth until they downgrade, which I'm sure will happen. An interest rate cut arguably could help the inflation situation by creating a housing supply. Well, okay. So we're not going to talk about housing too much, but would you be interested in selling your home? Suppose mortgage rates come down to maybe not as close to 3%, but maybe closer to 5% or 4%. And assuming the value of your home has appreciated significantly, you're going to lock in your capital gains. Yes, you might pay a little bit more in mortgage uh, uh, expenses from buying a home across the street, but you're still locking in gains. Would you consider that if mortgage rates come down a bit more? Yeah, I mean, I I personally am I'm not looking to move, but if yeah. I was, absolutely, because okay. that balancing act makes sense. Okay. And and I think that will certainly help. So which which argues could we could make the argument there that cutting interest yeah. rates, getting that ten year down a little more mm -hmm. will definitely, definitely help the housing market for that reason alone. Yeah, it'll soften some assets. I've heard the argument as well that the Fed may only cut when he sees signs of a slowdown in the economy or when the unemployment rate goes up. And so cutting may not be actually indicative of growth. It could be indicative of the opposite, which would signal perhaps a correction in the stock markets if he's cutting for bad reasons, right? Yeah, that's such a great statement. It's the why. There's I get so many questions on that to you. So if the Fed's going to cut, Jessica, are, are the markets going to surge? Well, it depends on the why. Right. Why are they cutting? Get, absolutely. Very beautiful point. Speaking of Taylor Swift, I think her Eros tour generated $5 billion for the for the economy. Could be funny if yeah. that's the reason Fed's, the Fed's not cutting. It's because Taylor Swift is you know actually contributing to growth. 
um, but I digress. Um, okay. There's studies on that. There's studies on that. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you've looked into those studies. Um, so ultimately, um, okay, let's talk about AI. Now you uh, you submitted a piece to me. Thank you for that. And you talked about how we're currently in the fifth industrial revolution. Tell us about your thesis there. Yeah. So there has been. The so thinking about the revolutions that we've had, it's compounding, where if you look at the movement that we have had when we just had railroads or water steam and mechanization and those assembly lines, they were building on one another that ultimately grow and compounds. So going back to the 1800s, I don't think we have to go through them all individually, sure. but perhaps the 2000s, there, we had a dot-com bubble in the 2000s is because we had companies we did not understand. Somebody put .com behind their company name. Everyone was excited about the internet. From a valuation perspective, it was very difficult to evaluate because we didn't understand the revenue drivers that were there. Fast forward to today, we use the internet and the World Wide Web absolutely everywhere in every single vertical with every way, every sh shape and form, which is proves that point of compounding. 2010s is when we got to that networking and machine learning, meaning now we're at this different place where it has compounded, where the framework has been built via the internet computers, electronics, and introducing automation. And now we have machine learning, and now we have extremely smart, now we're getting in the 2020s, of self-learning cognitive collaboration of machines. And there is so much that that can do as coding's being taken away and that language will soon be human. I think it's interesting. It used to be so valuable to have the skill Python on your resume. That's of the shift and we have to shift with those revolutions. Meaning there was this wonderful piece that I sent to you or, or the screenshot from Morgan Stanley where they were going through these previous revolutionary periods and it was 38% that analysts weren't projecting because it's difficult to evaluate. But I think the difference of difficult evaluation versus the 2000s and now is these are mature companies, not with clear paths to profitability, not companies that are in a garage with .com trying to figure it out, which we know Apple started there at some yeah. point. But this, this is different for that reason alone. And we are seeing real demand, which translates to real revenue. Yes, a lot of it is forward looking and there's the supply chain issues and things of that nature, but there is so much underestimation, I believe, within this entire entire AI because it also moves so fast. Uh, once I feel like I learn how to do something within AI, there's a new plugin or feature that I have to figure out. And that is good, but that also means that we have we haven't even tapped into it yet. We I really haven't. Tapped can you into give it. us a glimpse of the future? I think most people watching the show who aren't content creators or maybe work in finance professionally haven't really integrated their workflow with AI yet. Um, think about if you're working in an office and you've got legacy systems that are in place, you don't have to switch right away, and so most people don't use AI as much as um, some others, and so. Uh, it's difficult for many people to understand exactly why there's this big hype around it. Can you just give us a sense of how our lives could change in the next five to 10 years? Absolutely. So having a your own virtual assistant would be a piece of it, but having guardrails as well, where you can make your own type of collaborative type of experiences. So think about, let's go real back in time. If you remember on Microsoft products, I'm also advocating for this. If you remember Clippy. Yeah, I, right? I, was, I knew you were going to say that as soon as you said yeah. Microsoft. <laughs> Clippy. I loved Clippy. I really think they should be, bring Clippy back. That's where Copilot should be. Okay. That would be, be amazing. Um, nonetheless, I digress. But Clippy, helped that what well, was a new iteration within a magical tool that we had where you could instead of a typewriter we're writing on the computer it's saving time that's why it's a productivity increase so if we moved from a typewriter to a computer to utilizing a word document you don't have to erase things you just backspace it so now we're very quick and then if you don't understand how to use it oh you've got Clippy, who can help you when you search and ask, but you have to be very specific within the commands. Clippy is not a person. So now there is a tool where if you want to learn, think about it integrated onto your computer, and there are versions of that already, and you could set that up if you know how to integrate very well, where 
you could just speak to someone that could go through your data and understand what's needed there. Or you could say, I have all of these files on my desktop and you could do this today if you want. Can you please find any research that I have done on artificial intelligence, put that together on a Word document and then summarize the bullet points for me? That is incredible. And that that is a very small use case there's automation and triggers where you can have it do one task, learn to do another. You can give it guardrails, and then it can train itself. So we're, that's where AI is right now is on that inference and acceleration piece where it, it you teach it to train itself, which is scary in its own way, shape, or form. But if you think about what it is, it mimics human behavior. So even for, uh, I was working on some research yesterday, I had it create an infinite, um, and I got this from somebody, uh, I, I wish I remembered his name so I can give him credibility right now, but I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards, called it the infinite focus group, where I had ChatGPT give me, uh, for something I was looking to work on, a list of people that would be in that focus group. And it was my podcast. And I said, okay, what are they going to, why would they want to listen to my podcast? Give me their demographic, where they are, their family, things like that. And then I said, hey, very humanely, very humanely, it's going to be nice to, to chat GPT. I want you to inject some truth serum in them and we're going to have a conversation. And I want to know what their trepidations are really that they wouldn't tell in, in front of that focus group, in front of people. And then I got a very different response, which turns into marketing gold. So meaning there's just so many use cases that you can utilize purely from its implications today, but it, it can analyze very, very quickly, which is such an aid to productivity. And I believe there was, uh, this, this study was about six months ago. The people who use AI tools right now are 40% more productive. And that's a very small use case of people. So imagine when that's more widely adopted and put into those bigger corporations, which is in the works. That takes some time. If you ever yeah. worked on the procurement side, it takes a while to, to get those things across the line. But once they do, then we're going to really see some changes. Ultimately, investment implications. Yeah. I mean, have we missed a boat on companies like NVIDIA? Perhaps we haven't gotten in, but are the fundamentals still there for growth? I, I think so. I mean, there is definitely some demand pull and they're constantly, constantly innovating. And I think that is good to see. Their, uh, uh, the, uh, their, their Blackwell chip, that looks promising. They also have another one that could integrate directly onto your computer. So now your computer is AI, that the cooling of chips. So they're taking all of their problems and they're also looking to solve them as well. And so it's not just one product that is necessary. And also the AI pool is a really big pie and we have a sliver of that pie, which means there's still market share to go around. There's still lots of innovation that's needed. And as long as they're still innovating, then I do believe that there's still opportunity there. Uh, well, you've done that to some calculations. Uh, you've, you basically have a table of tech stocks and it says here, the average of every stock mentioned has beat earnings by 32%. And um, the conclusion is based on the underestimation average. We have another 11% on average of earnings surprises to the already revised higher. Can you just tell us, walk us through what you did there? Yeah, absolutely. So that was based on the Morgan Stanley report where they said the earnings estimates were constantly beat for previous evolutions or revolutions, if you will. So going back to that dot com area, that was about 38 percent. So if we're at and this so I used the 32 percent is including Pinterest because they were an early adopter. I want to take that out because that was a skew of a uh, hundred or 200% and that that just skews the data. So um, if you take that out, we've got about another 11% focusing just on AMD, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, Meta, and Amazon. So that that's where that came from. Since those are 17% all right now, and if the average is a 38% surprise, yeah. the difference there is 11% of growth. Ultimately, which subsector of tech would benefit most from the AI explosion besides, let's say, semiconductors? Yeah, so I actually still like Google. Amazon is just popped up on my list as of late um, because of the different touch points that are there. So Google was my first pick a while ago because when you look at 
how to build a large language model, they had most of the touch points. And what I find very interesting is the VC funding, and I don't, I don't know if you've um, seen any research on this, but they basically fund themselves in a way. It's this circular capital, as in they're investing in those companies that have AI and they give them cloud credits. And since they're investing in them, then they capture the revenue on it as well. So it's like circular capital within that way. The major ones are doing that, but, and and all of them require NVIDIA, which I find very interesting. If you have the cloud, you know, you have to have, so either you're going to pay that really high price point for the NVIDIA chip, or you're going to use something that has cloud that already buys that NVIDIA chip that you're going to need for those large language models. So there's lots of solutions that are there. Those are the obvious, but I think it's going to shift. So we start with building those models. That is that 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 starting point, the infrastructure, and then it's the implementation. So those that I think are going to emerge are the ones that take the headwinds and make them tailwinds. So now that we've got this grid issue, there's opportunity there. Cybersecurity is gonna be extremely important opportunity there. The cooling that we need, it requires a lot of commodities. That's opportunity. I, I flagged IBM, a, a, I feel like that was about, yeah, that was last year. <laughs> yeah. Um, IBM, I think, is also a really good opportunity because the way that they've resurged Watson X, they, they've they had some earnings surprises, but they also have a lot more demand and the, just the increase is, is amazing. So I, I, besides just the semiconductors, there is a lot of subsectors that will these out really, really well for AI. But I think the biggest sector that's going to have an impact on AI, and this not for the reasons that you think, is technology. Meaning because it can write code itself, it's going to streamline technology even more. So not just AI itself, it's the implementation. Because now I'm looking into the implementation, into financial services, into healthcare, and, and with the largest data set. But the largest data set is, in fact, technology. I know I know engineers are working on ways that AI can help us code in English and plain English, which would be a complete game changer because you no longer have to learn a language. Anybody can code. Uh, that would really yeah, that would really change things. Speaking of jobs that could be taken away from AI, I hope podcast hosts isn't one of them. Um, I agree. And that leads <laughs> to our next discussion. You have a podcast yourself, so you know not a robot can't replace Jessica and your co-host. Uh, at least not yet. Tell us why you launched your podcast and what that's all about. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for asking. I, I sincerely appreciate that. So I, I've worked in finance now for about 15 years, which is unbelievable to me. And I made this really big career shift. I'll never forget the day, February 22nd of 2022, where I uh, stopped working for the bigger brokerage firms. And now I, I work for a vendor called Options Play. And that allowed me the opportunity to not be constrained by financial licenses and, for lack of a better word, say whatever I want. Sure. So- so uh, my friend, I've always taught her about self-directed investing, but obviously you can't talk about that on social media when holding those type of licenses that I did. So I'm, I'm no longer licensed voluntarily. And she had this idea that said, hey, Jessica, every time you tell me something, I tell other people and I know more people can benefit from this. And on top of that, I've been the first female in a lot of places and where I find that the investing gap is derived from, it's not that, it, 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 yes, it is an oversaturated market with men, but men love to talk about the stock market. They just do not. If you ever meet a, a Wall Street bro, as they call it, they don't, they don't shut up. But what happens when they try to explain it to you, it's in relatable terms, not to me. I don't know anything about football and I don't really care about it. I, I, I don't get it because it's not my language. And so that's what our podcast is, is it shifts it from that type of language to just something that's a little more relatable to women on the, the mass and he, she's, they's as well. Anyone is, is here to listen, but we break down how the stock market works in those type of terms. So I teach her, I, she says that I made the biggest risk because I gave up my licenses and talk about it, but I think she took an even bigger risk because she sits there live and says, I don't understand how this works. Break it down again. 
And it takes a lot of courage for someone to say, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. But the results been, and all of our feedback is, thank you for asking the questions that I'm too afraid to ask. I finally get how it works. And it's been so rewarding, not only getting that feedback, but watching her progress. Even we did a recent episode on how to lock in higher rates using a CD ladder and using treasuries and things of that nature. But before we even, and that's the first time we physically placed a, a trade because it's a self-directing investing education podcast. That was episode 31. She needed all of that primer beforehand to understand who the Fed is, what they do, what an inverted yield curve is, even what the treasury is with supply and demand and the debt ceiling and, and all of that and understanding inflation to get to that point as to why that's needed. And it, I just love those light bulb moments. So if you tune into that, I know there's a long answer, so I apologize. You've, corru you've corrupted your friend. Now all, the, all she's going to talk about at dinner parties is the Fed and inverted yield curves. <laughs> and CD ladders. So yeah. That, it's it's possible, yeah. <laughs> you, you've changed her life for better or worse, who knows. Um, but certainly we'll tune into that. Uh, that is, so, but, but I mean, presumably this could be for anybody who is interested in finance, who is just starting to learn, right? It doesn't, um, it, it sounds like you're just educating the masses about basic financial concepts. Yeah, we still do stock market updates. Okay. Absolutely. So, so we bring it all together. So this is how it works, but here's also how it works today. And then also what's happened in the past. So it's definitely ramping up there. And it and she comes with questions. So there was a uh, question that she had about dark pools and how they work. Sure. So we went into detail and we talk about dark pools. We So it, it's definitely relevant to today. We haven't gotten any de technicals or anything too deep just yet. But if you want to learn how the stock market works from start to finish, that's absolutely the end the intent of it okay well uh where can we uh where can we find this podcast and follow your work on other platforms as well yeah thank you for asking so it's available everywhere that a podcast is streaming on your favorite podcast app i probably can't even name them all so it's on all the major ones of course apple spotify uh, good pods even google podcasts just went away so you can find us on youtube music and we do also upload to youtube we haven't put our rss feed into youtube music because we want to keep the video there so know that so i definitely recommend the best place would be spotify or good pods but we also have a website it's called market make her podcast.com. And there every episode, we include what's called episode equity, where if it needs a supporting article, we'll put that there. Anytime that we have additional takeaways that goes into our blog, which is called our dividends. We have lots of fun with the names Absolutely. as you can see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely, we'll put the links in the description down below. So make sure to follow Jessica and her work there. Thank you very much for your time. We'll speak again soon. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.